Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2016 to 2017 series, The Backstagers. Like Welcome Back, which I covered earlier, The Backstagers is a comic published by Boom Studios, a company that seems to have fully embraced the idea of publishing for a LGBTQIA audience. Good for them! This comic is written by James Tinian IV, who has become a pretty big deal in the comics industry, particularly for his work on Batman titles during DC's New 52 and Rebirth eras, and the writer of the critically acclaimed and fan favorite Batman slash Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles crossover, a series I covered on my blog before I started these videos. I should totally make video versions of that. Man. The art is drawn by Ryan C, whose work doesn't seem to be as mainstream or prolific as Tinian. Outside of this series, he's probably best known for the comic book adaptation of popular card game Munchkin, as well as some Adventure Time comics. Which seems very fitting because his art definitely reminds me of Adventure Time. Well, that or Steven Universe. I also want to point out that the coloring is done by Walter Biomonte. Sorry if I horribly mispronounced that. Because his coloring work, I think, is what really sells the art of this comic. He's apparently primarily worked on a bunch of Mighty Morphin Power Ranger comics, including a Power Rangers Ninja Turtles crossover. Wait, what the shit? That's a thing? Radical! So it probably shouldn't be too surprising that these three, with their powers combined, create a book definitely intended for a generally younger audience with lots of colors and goofiness. The plot primarily centers around the theater and the magic that happens there. Not from the actors, as you might expect, but from that group that works behind the scenes, and generally without much praise. That's the Backstagers, and it's time to take a look at their adventures, so let's take this away. The comic opens on Jory, who's having new kid blues all alone in the bushes. He's complaining to his mom about how he doesn't know anyone here because he's only just transferred to St. Genesius. Genesius. Genesius? Je, uh. An all boys high school named after the patron saint of actors. And comedians. And people with epilepsy. Not sure how that's connected. Jory's having trouble making friends because, as he says, boys are scary and they fart a bunch. That's so true. You are a wise little man, Jory. Since Jory's mom isn't going to be able to pick him up when school ends, she insists he join some after-school club, and that leads Jory to the one group he thinks he could get along with. Actors? He's so nervous when he goes to see if he can join their group, though, that he doesn't even notice this giant weird-ass double-eyed purple rat with pencils growing out of its head. That's a lot of things to not notice, just saying. Unfortunately for Jory, the theater kids are a really closed group, just like at my high school, and they're not interested in outsiders because they're busy worshipping at the altar of McQueen. No, not Steve or Lightning, I'm talking about Kevin and Blake. K and B are brothers who are a little too into each other, and into anime posing like they're some kind of walking talking JoJo's reference or something. Who actually does the gun finger under the chin thing in real life? Anybody? The McQueens are the two kings of the theater department, and they decide to induct the new blood by sending him on a quest to seek their most needed prop piece, which requires him to go behind the stage and through the scary door to visit the loathsome backstagers. Though, I don't know, maybe it's something about the fact that they're the title characters that convinces me that they're probably not gonna be so bad. The first backstager we meet is Sasha, the character that mostly just seems to have fallen through a bunch of Cartoon Network original cartoons before landing in this comic. He's endlessly peppy and loves pretty much everyone and everything, which is why he's defending another of those weird rat things that he has named Friendo. Next is Aziz, who doesn't seem to have a particular specialty, but he can be a bit bossy, and I think is generally there to help with the scenery and stuff. Also, interestingly enough, Aziz seems to be the only hetero cisgender major character of the comic. There's also this guy, who looks kind of like when they have 20-somethings play high schoolers in TV shows. His name is Hunter, and he loves his drill, sparkling, and plunging necklines. He's the set builder, and immediately takes to Jory. Next up is Beckett, who is the sound and lights guy of the group. Beckett originally attended the nearby all-girls school of Penitent Angels, before transferring to the all-boys school of St. G. 
Which means, yes, one of the boys at this all-boys school is transgender. I really like how underplayed that fact is, though. You almost have to be paying a lot of attention to even notice it, which really helps give the feeling of normalizing it, which is something more media out there could really use. With the backstagers assembled, they can address their rat problem. Or tool mice problem, as the group refers to the critters. Aw, they're kind of cute in a monstrous, demonic kind of way. The tool mice, like pretty much every major thing that comes at them in this comic, come from the area behind this weird door in the wall with a danger sign written on the floor before it. This area, which I'll call the backstage area because I'm not sure they ever call it anything else, is a magical world all of its own. They never explain much about it, and what little we learn we mostly get from description, like how the layout seems to be constantly changing, and that strange creatures and unknown dangers live back there. We only really get one good visual example of showing and not telling us what the backstage area is like, and I do love the visual, but I wish the creative team had taken the time to do more experimental art like this, even something as simple as changing up the pretty standard panel layouts for segments while they were in the backstage area. They do it some, but I don't feel they do as much as they could to really help the reader get an understanding. Once the team have boxed up and shipped away all of the tool mice back into one of the strange rooms deep in this area, Jory is finally able to return with the requested prop. The drama club is notably unappreciative of his efforts and uninterested in his tales of the magical back world of the backstage, so Jory realizes that he doesn't want to be an actor, he wants to be a backstager. Despite looming threats from creepy eyes staring out at them from the darkness. Yeah, I guess no one noticed that anyway. As production on the play progresses, the McQueens decide they need a rainbow of color, and luckily such a paint exists in the magical backstage. So Jory goes on a quest with a plunging neckline to find it. Oh, I, I mean with Hunter. He goes with Hunter. Hunter's assurance that he can lead them safely to where they need to go turns out to primarily just be an effort to impress Jory, and they end up being chased by giant spider monsters called Echo Spiders that are attracted to noise and eerily echo things you say. Man. That actually is pretty creepy. Luckily, the duo is saved by the appearance of some peanut butter. Well, that and the stage managers. Wait, there's stage managers now? The stage managers are seniors, Tim and Jamie, whose four years of experience have made them pretty good at surviving the dangers of the backstage world, which is why they know about the Echo Spider's hatred of peanut butter. Mmm, peanut butter. They're also... Uh, they also seem to know something about the class of 87, which we learn was an entire group of backstagers who went missing in the backstage area. But whatever they know, they're not telling Jory. As the day of the play draws closer, we begin to learn some more about Beckett. While he enjoys the company of the gang, he really appreciates his time alone up in the lighting booth. Time to be alone with his machines, which seem to be his true love, as he shows how much effort he puts into making everything up in his booth completely perfect. With the crowning glory, the special gym battery he found in the backstage that powers it all. He says it's all in the name of making the actors look good. Well, actor. One specific actor. A girl on loan from his old school, Bailey Brantwood. The coolest girl in the world. At least, so they will tell us every time she appears. It's a pretty good bit, honestly. But Beckett's plan of dazzling the girl of his dreams with his light show is smashed when stage manager Timothy insists Beckett start instructing Sasha on how to work the lighting equipment. I'm not sure Sasha has the state of mind for anything that complicated or sensitive, but what do I know? Beckett initially restricts Sasha to a small circle like he's a demon caught in a demon trap, but eventually caves to Timothy's wishes and lets Sasha have a go at the controls. This leads to him breaking the power gym and turning up the lights to blind Bailey, causing her to nearly suffer a horrible accident. This gets Beckett to lash out angrily at Sasha, and horribly upset by this, the poor little kid decides to run into the dangerous backstage all on his own to find a new power gym. For some reason, the group doesn't immediately decide to go after him, but instead wait until the final rehearsal the day before the play opens to start freaking out that Sasha hasn't returned. Then, instead of helping out with the rehearsal, they decide it's their duty as fellow backstagers, and Sasha's friends, to go after him. I'm really not sure why they couldn't have just put it off a few more hours since they didn't mind waiting a full day already, but uh, yeah, okay. They find Sasha at the Patchwork Bridge, which they say is the deepest anyone has gone in the backstage area. 
Jory and Beckett attempt to cross the bridge without much success, only to end up being saved by Sasha himself, who is for some reason busy repairing the bridge with duct tape like his name is Red Green. Sasha says while he was missing, he made a new friend in the backstage area named Polaroid, who gave him the duct tape because he wasn't able to cross the patchwork bridge again until somebody fixed it. Everybody then just kind of ignores this revelation, oddly enough, and they head back home to be confronted by Mr. Rample, the group's faculty sponsor. Mr. Rample was once a backstager himself, long, long ago, and is introduced here pretty much just to introduce him, it seems. Since the stage managers had mostly managed to cover for the kids' duties on the rehearsal while they were gone, they're mostly in the clear. Rample does reproach them for shirking their responsibilities, but pretty lightly. So, they all head off to work on the show, unaware that the creepy eyes from earlier seem to have grown more substantial now. Bum bum bum! Oh, wait, where'd, where'd he go? Now between shows, the backstagers decide it's time to relax by playing some games. Or really a specific game called Total Conquest, which is like extreme risk. What? No. Nobody has ever thought risk was too short. Nobody. Ever. Luckily, this nightmare is interrupted by a spooky voice calling out for help from the backstage area. Sasha suggests it might be a ghost, which doesn't really help anyone feel any better about it. No, Sasha, I'm not sure ghosts technically are people. I don't think that's how that works. Despite their concern, the stage crew decide to go investigate, only to stumble upon a group of girls that all seem to be oddly perfect equivalents of them. I mean, really equivalent. There are points where I can only tell the difference between Juniper and Hunter and their personal preference to plunging necklines. It seems that for some reason the backstage area isn't just their backstage area, at least not anymore. It connects to all backstage areas, and so the crew of St. G have run into the backstagers from Penitent Angels, the all-girls school Beckett used to attend. Wait, that's the school's name? That's kind of a messed up name. When they try to get out of the backstage and return home, something goes wrong. Suddenly, Jory finds himself trapped in an attempt to get him to become an actor on a ghostly stage, while everyone else begins turning into part of the theater or a tool. Like how Beckett becomes a spotlight, or Hunter becomes a drill. Wait, they're dating now? He's your boyfriend? When'd that happen? Did I miss a volume? To complicate things, Sasha's newest friend from the backstage, Polaroid, shows up. Oh, Polaroid is that ghost creepy face that's been watching them? That doesn't seem good. Polaroid calls the weird ghost theater they're in the Archetypal Theater, which is a concept from Plato. It's kind of the concept of the perfect version of something that exists on another plane, so this is apparently the plane. It's a pretty high-level concept to be introducing in such a kid's book like this. I'm not sure if that's really cool or really crazy. The art theater represents the very magic of the theater, and that magic is causing the backstagers to literally become the parts they play. Jory hasn't become anything yet because he's torn between the drama person he wanted to be and the backstager he's become. I guess. So Polaroid finds a new role for him to play, when Sasha helpfully volunteers the information that Jory can draw well. Polaroid pulls out a sketchbook he says once belonged to a good friend of his named Monkey, and it somehow allows the artist to control what appears in the backstage. Monkey actually used the book to create the patchwork catwalk we saw earlier, but apparently got too scared when he and Polaroid found it and ended up abandoning Polaroid, leaving him to be lost down there for 30 years. Polaroid- wait, 30 years? Man, looking pretty good for someone pushing 50p. Must be that theater magic. Polaroid wants Jory to use the sketchbook to set him and the magic free. Jory instead draws a cage around Polaroid, then grabs up everyone from both schools and books it toward a magic safe space he's drawn. Oh, right. Polaroid's a ghost. Duh. That's why he talks like this. Or, I I'm assuming. Jory erases Polaroid out of their safe space and then draws some magic doors to get them all safely home from their super fun adventure. Oh, sorry Aziz terrifying adventure. They get safely back only to discover that somehow they've been gone for two entire months. Yikes. During that time, the McQueens made good on an earlier threat to replace the stage crew with a professional crew. That's no bueno, but at least it gives them an excuse to make this funny little jab at rent. Nice. We also see how the rest of the group is affected. Hunter and Jory's moms are pissed. 
How did everyone explain this to their family anyway? Aziz's family forced him into track where they apparently feel like he should have been all along. Beckett seems to be practically living just outside the theater so he can sneak back in every morning to set back up his equipment that the pro crew keeps tearing down. There's also Sasha who somehow ended up on the football team. I don't know. One of the McQueens goes missing in the backstage when Polaroid kidnaps him and that prompts the backstagers to get back together. I kind of like how they decide here that this isn't just about saving the McQueen brother, or their theater, but all theater ever. Because if Polaroid and the magic of theater escaped the backstage, it would somehow destroy theater everywhere. It's such unironically ridiculous superhero level stakes here. It's amazing. They stop Polaroid and his plan by encouraging both McQueens to put on their planned play with their full heart, giving the best show of their lives one from the Arc Theater, and the other from the Theater of St. G. They're helped along by backstagers the world over, that the stage managers gathered on their way in by stopping in at another school on their way back from visiting colleges. Here we see that the similarities between the St. Genesius and Penitent Angels backstagers aren't limited to just them. Apparently, all backstagers everywhere are cut from the same cloth. Despite all the actors and backstagers getting in on this, I'm not really sure how anyone really participates in what's happening here. We don't really see anything. The only thing we really see happen is from their sponsor, because it turns out that he was Monkey from back in the old missing class of 87. Look ass! It was old Mr. Rample all along? Talk about your Scooby-Doo endings. Rample reveals that the class of 87 wasn't actually completely lost. Just a little lost. He was able to go and find them all and bring them all back. Everyone except for Polaroid, who went too far. In fact, the only reason he's been sticking around as a ghost is because Monkey drew him into the sketchbook. With a quick erasure, he undoes that mistake, and Polaroid is erased like he's been Thanos snapped out of existence. With that, the day is saved! Everyone gets to be friends again, and all goes back to normal. And I guess their parents are cool with them going back to doing the thing that made them disappear randomly for two months. With that, the comic comes to an end, so wait, what's this? Volume 3? Yeah it is! The third volume is just a collection of two supersized holiday specials, one for Halloween and one for Valentine's Day. They collect short little side stories that don't affect the main plot, and occasionally are not even by the same creative team, but are just some fun extra world building. Little stories like the scary creature that comes out on Halloween night to feed on people's fear, but Sasha helps us realize is actually sweet and cute and just misunderstood. Another of the stories is about a special Valentine's Day play that's just several tiny plays of two actors acting out famous love scenes from other plays. And Bailey Brentwood, the coolest girl in the world, is set to perform her scene with this dude, Brock Manchester, the coolest boy in the world. Yeah, he saved a busload of orphans once. It's no big. He also knows how to ride a horse and a motorcycle. And after only playing one game with the St. G basketball team? Whoa, okay Beckett, sorry. Jelly much? It's also interesting to note that there's a series of what seems to be middle grades novels about the backstagers, following the adventures of the comics and maybe some new ones. I don't know, I haven't read them. This isn't a book review. I mean, it's a comic book review, but it's not a book book review. Let's just get to the breakdown. Both the writing and the art of this series seems to be pretty heavily inspired by children's cartoons and manga, which is by no means a bad thing, but I do think it kind of limits it. It seems like a lot of times they go with the cute thing instead of the reasonable thing, and the random cuts to manga backgrounds actually feels a little jarring to me. I also wish they had made an effort to actually explain more what the backstage area actually is, or give us more of an idea of what it's like back there. Most explanation we get is almost entirely telling and not showing, and most of that is done in the abstract. When I'm having trouble explaining anything about the setting of the majority of the comic, I feel like you've done something wrong. But it's pretty much impossible to hate this book. It's cute and endearing, fun and funny, and the characters feel familiar and likable even while being over the top caricatures. So that's why I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Hi. When my biggest complaint about a comic is that it could have done a little more, I feel like that's a good complaint to have. 
The collected editions get one tool rat and two power gems. None of that is too bad, cause, you know, rats are our friendos. And that breaks down like this. Each volume has a nice cover gallery at the end, but that's all Volume 1 has. Volume 2 has some nice concept art, and Volume 3 makes up for its short comic page count by having still more concept art, a cool script to page breakdown, and a really cool 3D map layout of St. G. Extra nice. Thanks everybody for watching, I hope you enjoyed my final video for June. If you did, be sure to subscribe and comment below what you would like to see me cover. I'm open to reading pretty much anything for any age group, so feel free to suggest away. Next week it's almost the 4th of July, so I'll have a special video for that. So I hope to see you then, right here, in the Comic Cave.